you know, yeah, I, I, look, I, I like to think of this not just as a Jeffrey Combs podcast, but as a podcast about humanity, mm. you know? Well, that's kind of what it is. You know, you, on the surface, of course, it's Jeffrey Combs, but underneath, it's just a bubbling, bubbling pot of everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, only, only an idiot, only a fucking fool would look at this Jeffrey Combs podcast and think that's only about Jeffrey Combs. Exactly. It's about the human spirit. It's about, um, it's about, you know, cooking. It's about family. It's about other celebrities, <laughs> other obscure celebrities. <laughs> I think what this podcast mainly is about is about courage. Mm, that's well. That's I thought we didn't need to say that, but that's great that even now we can speak <laughs> the true subtext of it. Hey, Alistair Trombley Birchall. Lisa Dib. Yes. Welcome to Reanimates. My goodness, it is so good to be back. So good to have you back, especially because I assume now you know who Jeffrey Combs is. Now I can't get him out of my mind. Um, <laughs> that face is burnt into not only my retinas but also the front and back of my eyelids so you could actually see it from the outside of my face if I close my <laughs> eyes which I don't dare do anymore I think that's that's the effect that he wants like in his acting career is that he wants to be an inescapable force and it's worked uh, it's it's gravity it's the weak atomic it's the strong atomic and, and then it's Jeffrey Combs those are all the the universal constants the the powerful <laughs> forces that are in this uh that bind the universe together jeffrey combs is all of the elements that make up captain planet wow heart especially heart and then the others yeah, yeah. It, it feels like when jeffrey combs speaks on screen it's like he is speaking to the animals because we kind of seem so lesser in comparison you know, he is probably closer to the angels than he is to the beasts. Would you say that? Absolutely. I mean, that's the main thing that goes through my head when I am watching a Jeffrey Combs TV show or movie is that I am not worthy mm. and that I really should be inscribing his words in some sort of golden plate, a la Joseph Smith. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you have your magic glasses. Yeah, I kind of have a laser and I'm always engraving a diamond um, whenever... <laughs> Whenever Jeffrey speaks or spake, I think that's how you talk about somebody of that of that level. I think you have to go and use that really old uh, conjugation. It thus spake Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> well, he does a lot of spaking in <laughs> this TV show. <laughs> Nailed that. Absolutely. I think you'll find. Yeah, that was a good link. Yep. We're covering season two, episode four of Stan Against Evil. Uh, episode Girls' Night. It's a pretty fun show, if you haven't heard of it. I hadn't heard of it before I watched it for this podcast, but I might end up watching more of it because it was actually kind of fun. Yeah, I had I had a good time. It, it's amazing how much content gets made these days and that people who I would say, like, so this was made by, the, the show is created by Dana Gould, uh, and I thought he was a relatively obscure comedian who, you know, was pretty big. Uh, to a certain extent, like compared to people I know, um, except for Ronnie Chang, who is now the most famous person in the world. But <laughs> yeah, that that someone like that can just have their own series. You know, I think that's uh, I think I think the world's come to a good place where at least there can be enough niches that people who in other times may have been out of work are now working full time. He's he's very funny. He was a writer for The Simpsons, two thousand and one to two thousand and seven. Which is a pretty, like, big achievement. But I think we can all agree that probably his finest work was the cameo that he had in the Mystery Men as Squeegee Man. <laughs> He's got, yeah, I mean, that, that was a great role. He's got a very expressive face. I think he had a, you know, a troublesome dad. Uh, he, was, he was a very successful early on in stand-up. Like, you know, he probably started, like, 1819 or maybe even younger. But I th or maybe he was, like doing quite well by 1819 one of those guys who started like 16 17 something like that he had that joke which is i think is a joke of his which is that he's had his hand in more pilots than a air force proctologist <laughs> and clearly one of those pilots got picked up for a season mm. so this episode was directed by jack bishop and justin nim who directed heaps of stuff for funny or die so that's the kind of that's the kind of like 
people that have that have that are working on this that the funny or die crew the funny or die people must all grow up eventually as well you know college humor people are probably now parents humor you know maybe maybe even <laughs> maybe even grandparents humor uh it was written by jessica conrad who was a writer for the simpsons as well and also for snl cool yeah like like good quality people working on this mm. so and i think it shows like it's got like really good uh joke ratio sure and a lot of that comes down to the performances which we'll talk about i would say the di- dialogue was snappy yeah it keeps the pace i mean you know like it has to this is only what 22 minutes or something yeah. you know, it's got to be it's got to be snappy no room for faffing about no i wish there was <laughs> We all love a bit of faffing. Yeah, you gotta you gotta wait till after the show to do some faffing. The premise of the show in general, just for those who haven't seen it, is it's about uh, a man living in a new small New Hampshire town, which is built on the site of a massive witch burning. So the town is constantly haunted by demons, spirits, witches that all hate, like the cops of this town, basically, because the cops were responsible for their demise back in the day. They also hate basically all of the descendants of those cops, hmm. uh, which includes. Stan Miller, who is our protagonist, uh, as well as his replacement, Evie Barrett. And Stan Miller is Dr. Cox. John C. McGinley. Yeah. Yep, notably of Scrubs fame. Yeah. And also, uh, probably the best, one of the best uh, talk show appearances in all history, when he appeared on Conan and he started talking about being a gravy guy. I'm a gravy guy. He goes, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm a gravy guy, Conan. <laughs> like that. What does that mean? You're a gravy guy. You know when I'm when I'm when I got when I'm you know when I'm at dinner, I get my own you know boat. I'm, a, I'm a, like I said, I'm a gravy guy. Well, in the episode, your friend and mine, Jeffrey Combs, is actually the first person we meet uh, because we open on a fun fair mm. carnival in 1816. Jeff is playing like a carnival barker mm. sort of guy, con man. He's credited as Impish Man, but I'm not going to call him that. I'm just going to probably just call him Jeffrey Combs because that's his name. Um, he's he, he, he's already eerie early on. I, I, I think I, I felt straight away. You know, I don't know if it was the music, but I, you know, I the way or maybe it was just the way that Jeffrey plays him. But, you know, it something was being communicated to me that not everything was right. Something was afoot. Probably his feet. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, his both not, both his feet can be a foot if you mo- if you fuse them together, make one foot. He says, "Play my game, and you can win a Bible or a new husk of corn," mm. which I, which is a joke I like. <laughs> yeah, maybe because corn is a funny word. Sure, it's also a stupid thing to win, unless you're a bird. Jeff is approached by a policeman played by Jonah Ray, who comes over to play, and he wins a corn. Yay! This cop is really funny. Like the the actor who's playing him is just. He's just really good at this kind of like old timey guy. Yeah, uh, it's quite fun. He's and he's having a lot of fun with it, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Fam- famously from Nerdist podcast back in the day. Um, I-, I assume that that that's still running, but I don't know anymore. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about it either. There is a few links to like Nerdist stuff as well. Is Nerdist like linked in with Funny or Die? Like, are they part of the same like house or something? I think you know it's probably all LA based comedian kind of things i don't know it's a big it was a very big online internet company with you know media production house so they may be linked in some ways yeah jeff's character offers him a new deal and he's like hey cop if you win the next game you can have all of my corn and bibles but if you lose you have to kill yourself and the cop is like oh that's just a dark joke and he decides to play and you guessed it he loses he he his reaction is is this which i just thought was funny Pardon my language, sir. Applesauce. You know, if I was a cop, I wouldn't have done it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I wouldn't. I don't know. I don't know if I. You know, I like. I don't know if I care about people trusting my word that much. Yeah, I probably would have just been like, "No, nah, I'm not gonna." How do you think people feel, or how do you feel about your word? I think it is meaningless. Yeah. Because I'm gonna do what I want anyway. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm a fucking rebel. <laughs> yeah. Like, why would you become a person of your word? Just a little, you know, cut yourself some slack. What are you? What are you gonna follow through on every promise you make? Jeez. Like a weirdo. Sometimes you're an idiot. You know. <laughs> you got. You can't. You can't just do what you say. 
What about you know? What about every time you get drunk and you tell someone you're going to start a podcast with them? Oh, Ugh. Exactly. Or all the times when you're sober and you tell them you're going to start a podcast with them. <laughs> or when you're sober and you agree to be on a mate's podcast. That's one of my favorite things to do. Don't you ever say that that could be a mistake. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the cop does shoot himself in the head. And then cue credits. That was a good episode. <laughs> Bye, guys. We first meet Stan John C. McGinley. He's in his house with his daughter, Denise, who is played by Deborah Barker Jr. Uh, she's done heaps of TV. I haven't heard of a lot of it, but that's not saying much because I'm not good with TV shows. She's, I guess, without having seen other episodes, I can't tell, but she's definitely played to be not very bright. Yeah, I thought she was a wife. Um, I just thought she was a not bright wife, and it didn't come across as daughterly to me. Well, it's also not clear how old she's meant to be because she looks like she could be in her late 20s, early 30s, but she dresses like a child. Yeah. Even if you haven't seen the show before, we already know that she's not very bright because she has made herself a waterbed by filling a beanbag with water mm. in her room. And so Stan is trying to fix like this weird sort of gooey pustule that's coming out of the roof, like the water's leaking and it's got like a big gooey bubble in the ceiling. Yeah, it's gross. It's it's kind of gross. It's squishy like pudding. Mm. It's really horrible. Yeah. And then we soon meet uh, Evie, who's played by Janet Varney, uh, who's also done a lot of comedy TV and shorts. I think she used to date Chris Hardwick from The Nerdist. Of yeah, from The Nerdist. Um, that's you know not strict, not hugely relevant, but just something else I noticed. No, look, we're finding these Nerdist connections. We're gonna f- figure this whole thing out at the end. So Evie comes over for girls' night. She and Denise are gonna watch like this like bachelor type show mm. uh which i think is called the fiance yeah stan is like this character is very similar to dr cox who john john mcginley also played very grouchy uh very gruff uh very masculine it seems like all he's done is kind of just uh roughen up his voice a tiny bit Ugh, like that yeah I think Stan is definitely meant to be a little bit more rural and working class. Yeah. So Stan goes to a bar, and in the bar he is approached by Jeff, who starts offering him, like, kooky little wages. He also, because we already know he's a little bit of a magic guy, Mm. he makes himself the host of the dating show that Evie and Denise are watching. And he's going to use that to, like, start hypnotizing Evie, convincing her to basically do away with Denise. He's like, Denise is in your way. You could win the fiance show if you kill denise mm. so she starts going crazy but he's kind of both the host and potentially the fiance yeah yeah because well, well, well you know the quote-unquote bachelor yeah because it, it does seem like she's trying to get his love as well yeah it's kind of like i guess here if in, in australia if you watch the bachelor if osher gunsberg or ginsberg was the also the bachelor every season <laughs> yeah the guy who's running the operations and that would be cool I wouldn't mind that if, if it was just a show about Osher accumulating wives. Here's just a little clip of Evie starting to go a little bit crazy. Why are you wearing makeup? I'm not wearing makeup. I was wearing makeup, but now it's gone. Did you take it off my face? Get me some makeup! Okay. I think my mom used to have some upstairs. Oh, yeah, that's just what I need. A dead woman's makeup. Okay, I think I have some too. Get me some! Okay. I need a living woman's makeup! So Stan eventually figures out that Bar Jeff is not human because Jeff eats an entire giant jar of pickled eggs. And I really like the line where Stan says it's full of comb juice from the barber shop. Yeah. Which combs aren't meant to be juicy, are no. they? I mean, putting putting aside the combs, combs pun, I'm aware that it's there. I'm not ignoring it. Why would a comb... Yeah, do barbers keep their combs in a kind of liquid sort of like you would keep like an ice cream scoop? (laughs) Yeah. You know, like to kind of like just keep it lubricated so that you can always just pull it through some hair. Maybe there's a little oil in there or something like that that maybe the barbers love to... For some reason, I do picture them in a kind of bluey, greeny liquid, but I don't know why. Why would you you put a comb in like a beaker with with some green blue liquid well especially because normally when they comb your hair at a hairdresser i don't know if you've ever been to a hairdresser before al i'm looking forward to one day doing that (laughs) i'm praying for you they usually wet the hair not the comb Mm. and then they comb it yeah but what if you found out i mean look imagine they wet the hair with water but then you find out they're actually they're keeping that comb in just a jar of lube 
Do you ever do you ever get tangles? Do you ever get tangles when they're when they're doing it at the hairdresser? They probably got a trick to you know to unlock every single one of those knots with their just comb lube. No, I don't want comb lube. I would say that maybe this character knows something that we don't. They're probably there's probably a hint here that there's this whole aspect of the world that we don't understand, and it's probably all linked to combs. And the liquids in which they live. Oh my god. His name probably isn't even Jeffrey Combs. It's always just been a big hint. It's pro- probably just Jeffrey Liquid. Stan asks him about his ancestor, Thaddeus Eccles. And he was the one who, back in the day, burned all the witches in the town. There, there is a bit where Stan starts to talk about like the overarching plot of the TV show, which is that Thaddeus is... One of his descendants told Stan that he has to find someone called Gerard Duquette. Mm-hmm in order to use these eyeballs to travel back in time to save his wife's life because his wife is dead. I'm sure that that's all relevant in other episodes, but A, not strictly relevant for this episode, and B, I don't know if I'm going to watch any other episodes necessarily, so I kind of just let that stuff slide. I wonder whether every episode has a little hint to that so that they're like, well, anybody who watches an episode can get an idea about what's going on, then they can, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get more hooked. It's a little hook there. Like a fish. Like a fish. I mean, every viewer is a fish trying to nibble on some attention. That's what they're trying to feed. They're trying to get you to eat. No, they're trying to get your attention. The bait, the Mm. worm on the hook is content. Yeah. The hook is a television. Okay. Yeah. The rod is the people who make the (laughs) TV show. The person holding the rod. Is that God? God. Yeah, it's God. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the person who's holding the rod's mother. Who's that? With the Big Bang, a comb, and then and then that <laughs> yeah. and then, then the world that those people are in, that's the comb juice. That's the jar of pickled eggs <laughs> that we all live in. Okay, now I'm following you. This is my theory. Uh, I'll send you a pamphlet. Here's just a little sound of Jeff. My witch's brew, it's just two ingredients: showmanship and pizzazz. So Jeff tells him he's going to kill him, basically. Mm. And then he transports them both out into the woods so that Stan can relive the day that when he was a kid, he decided to become the sheriff. So he's there watching like himself as a kid. I love Jeff's natty little outfit in this scene. He's got like a nice waistcoat. He's got a pocket watch, lovely burgundy jacket. He's good. He looks like sassy devil guy. Yeah. De- decent wardrobe budget on this show. You know? You, yeah. You think those... They can afford pocket watches. Absolutely. I mean, these people probably spend a lot of time in thrift shops. Picking up old suits and pocket watches, as you just said, and uh, you know, and then and then and then they just have a menagerie. Is it, what's a menagerie? Like a zoo. A zoo. Okay. Well, they don't have a menagerie, but they have a big closet filled with these things. <laughs> I'm really not adding much in this in this wardrobe department bit. I'm sorry. In a way, a wardrobe is like a zoo. For clothes. It's like a zoo for your clothes. That's right. <laughs> you go. And you look at them. That's right. And you admire them. Yeah. And and what are animals if not sort of clothes larva? They're just, you know, fur and skins and stuff like that that you could be wearing once these animals perish. You walk into a menagerie, it's just not a closet yet. <laughs> Everything's almost a closet. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the memory, little kid Stan finds a man who's having a heart attack. And when he approaches him, the guy starts like grabbing him. So he does what any child would do and starts kicking the shit out of him. A uh, very normal reaction. Yeah. I think he grabs him a little bit and then the kid's like, I think he's like, yeah, I'm going to kick the shit out of this man. Yeah. I think, well, the troublesome thing is that he enjoys it. Like he kicks, he kicks this guy and just keeps kicking him and starts to like enjoy it, which makes sense when you realize he's a cop. Uh, a cab, even Stan Miller. Uh, and, and this is, this is his explanation. I enjoyed kicking the shit out of that guy. I love guns and I love telling people what to do. Hell, it was a match made in heaven. Yeah, and then Jeff, you know, he says what we already sort of know, which is that Jeff, uh, his character was burnt by Thaddeus at the stake back in the day. So we do cut back to Evie and Denise. Uh, TV Jeff has given Evie this really beautiful dagger. It's a really nice dagger. Oh, yeah. The dagger budget on this show is amazing. People <laughs> going out to thrift shops, buying daggers, <laughs> putting in a big room. Is that what a menagerie is? No. It's a room full of daggers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I reckon, as far as like weapons go, I don't think I could ever have like a gun. Mm. But I think I'd love a little nice dagger. I think yeah. that'd be really nice. Keep it under your pillow? 
No, I'd probably accidentally stab myself in the yeah, face. Yeah, what if it had? What if it had like a like a nice, you know, like a sheath or a blade, a thing of thing with a blade holder? Oh yeah, like shuk. Yeah, yeah, kill Bill. Shing. Yeah. Like that. You want to get that nice oh. metal sound yeah. as it comes out? And also that'll be really like nice a, sound. Be a warning to any to any uh, you know uh, attackers. Oh, I don't want them to know I'm coming. I don't want it then. Yeah, but you know, maybe it's dark and they're <laughs> coming into your room, and then you go, "I know you're there." Shing, and then they'll just run, and then you don't have to have a confrontation. Oh, that's handy. Yeah, I wouldn't want to get blood all all over my lovely dagger. Exactly. <laughs> I think that if I was gonna have a dagger, I'd want it to be encrusted with something, mm. like it's jewels. jewels maybe. Yeah, jewels. Great choice. Yeah. Most things that are encrusted mm. are usually encrusted with jewels. Yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. hear that term used unless it's jewels. It's not like b- pancake batter or something like that. Yeah, or it's not like just something being stuck in something. Like, oh, my my laptop keys are encrusted with uh, breadcrumbs. Yeah, <laughs> with old two-minute noodles, yeah. My, my phone isn't charging properly. The, um, the, the charging port is all encrusted with tomato sauce. Oh, you've had, you had a bad squirt day. Uh, Every day's a bad squirt day, mate. (laughs) (laughs) Just figuring out what that means is a lot of fun. Uh, It doesn't... I know. Exactly. There's no no clear meaning. And that's what's fun about (laughs) it. It doesn't need to have one. It's the the cloud of probability that makes you laugh. (laughs) Yeah, so Evie's... (laughs) Evie's gone a bit wrong at this point. TV Jeff is pitting her against Denise. She's going crazy. Then we also get, well, we get a appearance from one of the only other characters we meet, who is Deputy Sheriff Leon, played by Nate Mooney, mm. who was Ryan from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You joke. I haven't watched the show, but that's who he is. Mm-hmm. Wow. He seemed fun. Yeah, he just sort of barges in. Like, he knows that they're having a girls' night, but he's decided to come over with a six-pack of beer anyway, uh, which could be why Evie starts attacking both Leon and Denise. Mm. So... Stan and Jeff arrive at home, and Jeff is disappointed that everyone is alive because back at the bar, Jeff made a bet with Stan where he was like, hey, I bet when we get back to your place, uh, someone will be dead. Mm -hmm. And of course, why would Stan think that anyone would be dead? So he's like, fuck you, buddy. So Stan won the bet, and then Jeff briefly turns into like a goblin kind of creature. You might even say he turns into a bit of an impish man. I would absolutely say that. And I would have said that even before you told me that that's what his character was called. You refer to so many things as an impish man. That's though. true. Even just the other day, you said, you said, Dibbo, your laptop is looking so impish man that's lately. Right. And, and, and it was noodle encrusted and sauce encrusted. And that's what I call that. That's fair. I do normally eat my dinner out of my laptop keyboard. <laughs> just on a normal bad squirt day. <laughs> um, bad squirt day. Da, 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 da. I don't know what that no, song is. I love it though. <laughs> it's, you're going to be a star. I was hoping that once I started it, I'd realize what song I was parodying. It, no, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm sure there's enough songs that go like that that we could we could find a way of extending it. And I think one day we will. Uh, it could be Girls, Girls, Girls by Motley Crue. Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. Girls, girls, girls. Exactly. Well, yeah, See? that could work. As the impish man in, in, in this impish moment, Jeff is very scary and it's a fair bit of work probably i think in prosthetics or whatever it was his camera trickery in order to make him that scary for such a minute amount of time yeah he he only changes really briefly i'll post a picture of his transformation but he um i think he just sort of has like a a prosthetic nose and a prosthetic chin and i think some like color around the around the face i think he goes a bit green maybe yeah he kind of has like a bit of a like everything's just like a bit turned in like he's got like like a moon chin. Yeah, like a like a Leno chin kind of thing. I mean, you get a bit Leno. Yeah, but even more pointed. Yeah, pointed. You know? Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like a curly shoe, like an elf would wear. <laughs> yes. He has one of those curly shoe chins. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen a whole chin curl, but that's... Anyway, but yeah, it's quite spooky. And then, yeah, so we realized that he was like... He was kind of demon-y. At some point, he's, you know, in that bar scene, he kind of says... He says... When when Stan asks him, "Are you some kind of witch or something like that?" He does kind of say yes to that, and so he's this weird, like, yeah, he's kind of he's he's just a magical being of some sort who loves a wager. He uh, he hints at the idea that he's a witch, but he is just kind of like a kind of a goblin magical 
magical little guy who likes to play tricks on people. That's right. I guess I guess that's sort of what it what it imp is in like in like magical mm. folklore. Yeah, and I think that's kind of what just what he was burnt for for just kind of like fortune telling or something like that, right? Yeah, just general, just general being a magic just guy. Just a bit weird. You're a bit, you know, you're a bit off. Yeah, very. Nineteenth century was full of like no weirdos, no people with like short hair, nobody who eats turnips on a Tuesday, just stuff like that. Yeah, weird yeah. rules, you know. Pythagoras was a bit like that. He was like, no beans. Uh, I'm not. We're not. None of us are fucking with beans. Okay. Is that a real fact? That is a real fact. Pythag- I mean, it would be crazy for me to bring up Pythagoras. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, Al. I know. But it would not be out of the ordinary of this particular conversation. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. But yeah. But I'm just saying, I th- I'm pretty sure Pythagoras hated beans. And it's just things like that. But I bet that's a bit er- earlier than 19th century, I think. A little bit. Yeah. But I feel like every generation has its people who hate beans. Exactly. Every generation. This, is- this show is really about... That generation's Pythagoras's Pythagori. <laughs> I think it's a ancient Greek or Latin or something. That's what must be I as the pluralization. Pythagoras, yeah. Greek, isn't it? Pythagori. Py- yeah. Oh, but yeah, Pythagori, Pythagorides. <laughs> One of the more famous Greeks, yeah. surely. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Apart from Nick Giannopoulos, yeah. obviously. <laughs> yes, and my big fat greek <laughs> which is your mother <laughs> <laughs> that's just what you call her it's mean stop calling her i'm that. sorry <laughs> <laughs> so jeff does go to kill stan but stan offers him a new wager and he says let's flip a coin and he makes it a little bit complicated heads stan kills evie jeff kills stan or Tails, Evie kills Stan, Jeff kills Evie. And then he gives a third caveat where he's like, hey, if it doesn't come down at all, then everyone goes free and Jeff has to kill himself. And obviously Jeff is like, what's this fucker up to? Why wouldn't it come down? I don't know. I don't, this is silly. This is a bit silly boots. He's like, how can I lose? And so Stan throws the coin up into the roof pustule mm. in, the, in the ceiling pudding. Yeah, ceiling goo. And it gets stuck. Yeah. Oh man, he had I don't even know if he had tested enough how viscous that stuff was. But it worked. God damn it it worked. Thank God. Thank God for Denise and her crazy schemes. Yeah, it would have been the end of that series if he hadn't <laughs> hadn't worked out. And I think Dana would have loved to get more episode on the you know on the books there, you know, in the can. Yeah, and he he wasn't to know that Jeffrey Combs had the real life ability to magically kill all of his castmates and so he did you know if, if like in in the universe where that episode went that way and now he's in space prison space prism like with an m prison ah yes but i mean i imagine in space you know one day we'll probably store all our bad people in prisms you know as, as a sort of a beam of light or something why do they get to be a beam of light well, i want to be a beam of light well maybe one day hey lisa don't stop believing <laughs> <laughs> You two can be a prison, baby. Yeah, that's when the squirt days end. Bad squirt days. <laughs> <laughs> and the good squirt days, though. You can't you can't have good squirt days without bad squirt days. <laughs> that's what I've learned in this life. Yeah. You take the good with the bad. Yeah. Until you're a beam of light stored in a prism. That's what people, you know, you know like how people these days complain about prisoners having like TV and blankets and stuff? Yeah. They're always like, oh, they, they live better than me, blah, blah, blah. That's what they're going to be complaining about in the future. They'll be like, oh, why do they get to be in a prism? I work hard all day and I don't have a prism. I don't even have my own prism. How come they get to be in a bit of glass floating through space? I have to stay on that. I'm going to rent my prism. I don't even own mine. So what do you think? Good episode? Hang on, it's not done oh, yet. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Hold your bloody horses. Sorry. <laughs> Hold them tenderly. They're sad. <laughs> Horse. Sad horse. <laughs> just, just give him a cuddle as he sheds a single horse tear oh, down your giant down tear. his face. Oh, and he's he's nestle, nestling into you, and you have to give him a pat behind the ears and a nice puts carrot. two hoofs around your back. You're holding up its whole its whole front body, and that's how you died. <laughs> I you wouldn't mind that being crushed by a sad horse. Uh, actually, maybe I do mind. Stan throws the coin into the roof pudding. It gets stuck. 
Jeff turns into like a goblin guy and he like melts away like the Wicked Witch of the West, but not without giving him giving us some like pizzazz hands. Like he goes out like a showman. Oh, yeah. He does like Bob Fosse jazz hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Evie snaps out of her madness and Denise suggests making some fried chicken. And that's the end of the episode. Quirky. It was really quirky. But you know, when you deal with uh, the supernatural all the time, like I bet these folk do, you know, you, you figure out what's a nice remedy for, uh, you know, all the trauma that you're experiencing on a daily basis. And that's probably just good food and just getting on with your life. Well, one of the things I like to do is look up the IMDb goofs on whichever TV show or movie that I'm covering. Uh, because I like to see what the finicky weirdos of the internet are saying. This one only had one that I thought was interesting, but it's a good one. So this is from the I- the goofs on IMDb. The prologue of this episode takes place in 1816 and features a gun that wouldn't be invented until 1836. That's really good. Mm. That's really good. <laughs> yeah. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it, yeah. TV show. That's, you know, that's gonna re- that's actually changed my ex- experience of that beginning of that show. Yeah, I hate the show now. <laughs> stick th- stick that in your gun and shoot it. Who knows? I mean, was corn quite different back then? You know, how like how quickly are we making, you know, like they, they make new breeds of apple. Like when did the pink lady get made? It feels like it's only like in the last 30 years, right? I know that I know that I like to tell you that I'm an expert on apples, but I'm actually not. <laughs> I apologize. I've come, I've come onto this apple podcast thinking that you were an expert on apples. I thought this podcast was really about everything. No, it's all a ruse. I'm just a, I'm just a con man. I just do it with showmanship and pizzazz. It's the one thing you can always say about me. Ah, uh, that Dibbo, she's full of pizzazz. You hop to trot. Is that, is that a thing to say? Is that right? Yeah, sure. I do have hot trotters. <laughs> like a pig. <laughs> I don't know what hop to trot really means, but I know that a friend's dad told me that once when I was in high school. And to use it to describe me. To describe you? Yeah. Oh, I always thought it meant like kind of sexy. Oh, well, great. Well, we're, we're both doing really well. <laughs> Oh, your mate's dad was in love with you. <laughs> Pretty exciting. It's actually really nice. So that's that's Stan Against Evil. Question, Alistair. Mm-hmm. If if this show was readily available to you on, say, a streaming service that you already are signed up to, would you watch any other episodes? Yeah, I think so. I don't, you know, I don't watch a lot of TV series, but you know, I I think. The, the comedy content is enough to get me over the... I don't watch enough pure comedy stuff, and I feel like this is pretty much just about the comedy. You're not there for the emotional arcs. <laughs> there isn't really huge emotional arcs. Like, it's, you know, it's not like a show that has, like, a big sweeping moral ending. It's just a bit of fun with some silly monsters, mm, really. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know... That's all it needs to be. You know, and I like monsters. In fact, I, I check under my bed. I check under my bed every day, and I'm disappointed that there's not one. Oh, I'm sorry. One day there will be. Yeah, uh, you know, it's all right. Maybe one day I'll be lucky enough for there to just be like a like a human monster, like a murderer or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, oh, it's just a psychopath. Yeah. Somebody I wanted a demon a, or something. Yeah, someone who burnt down a children's hospital. Or... Some monsters are more fun than others. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm a, I'm a spooky ghost, and oh, I'm a cannibal. Like... I feel I feel like Jeffrey Combs would play a great cannibal. Why, Alistair? Eh? I just think that, you know, I think there's that there's that face. There's that face that he's got that um that implies something spooky's about to happen. Like you you go, I don't know why he seems a little bit off, you know, you're watching him in a regular, you know, in a regular scene and then you go and then you find out at the end of the scene that's cuz he's a cannibal. He's he's really good at playing people with like an undercurrent of something suspect, and sometimes it's that he's a mad scientist, and other times he's a cannibal. Mm, exactly. And who's to say which is worse? Yeah. <laughs> you can be a mad scientist and a cannibal if you yeah. want. It's hey, twenty twenty one, guys. Are there any mad scientists that are just actually just mad, like just upset, <laughs> like angry? Yeah, are they angry, or is it, or is it all that they're insane? They're usually angry in addition to being insane. Okay. Yeah, because usually they're angry about, like, you know, their work not being appreciated or uh, their their monster has not turned out the way they wanted and they're upset yeah. about it. <laughs> so they, 
So they weren't mad before they started creating monsters. Oh, no, they were perfectly normal. They were just like, I'm just going to create a monster for a lark. And that's what sent them mad. The process of trying to create life like a god would. Oh, yeah, of course. That's right. Look, this all makes sense to me now. Thank you so much for clearing that up, Lisa. You truly are <laughs> a genius when it comes to apples. <laughs> you know what they say. A dibbo a day keeps your apples away. <laughs> apple facts away. I don't know. No, an, an, an Apple fax is what I use to send my apples through the, sure, <laughs> the yeah. telephone line. It's it's done wonders for Apple distribution. Um, would you watch this show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the show. Yeah, I think I would. Um, I, too, am not very good at watching TV shows. Like, I'm just not good at sitting down and watching a whole bunch of episodes or something in a row. I don't know if that's my attention span or... I think something has to be like really good for me to think I'm going to spend several hours of my time watching this. But yeah, I think because this, you know, is is relatively short and it it really does just fly by and it's a bit of good fun. And especially because, you know, I was looking at the other episodes and they've all got like pretty decent guest stars as well. Yeah, I think I probably would. And, you know, and I just want to support old mate Dana. Yeah, love that guy. Love Dana Gould, you know, weird tortured face. Well, I'll 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 tell him that you send your love. Thank you so and much. And I won't tell him that you said he has a tortured face. Well, only in his bit. He, he can make it tortured. I think he can also look calm. You know, he's got a lot of range. And, you know, maybe that's why we didn't see him on screen. You know, because he doesn't... Sometimes you keep your best player on the bench so that you can let other people shine occasionally. And that's the generosity of Mr. Gould. I believe that. Yeah. Um... And I know that you are an authority on baseball, so that metaphor great. checks out. Yeah, great. When I was when I was saying it, I want you to know I was thinking about soccer. But but <laughs> <laughs> I really like what Jeff was doing here. I think he was like playing like a fun kind of like evil but charming, sneaky, devilly guy. I give how many combs do you give it? One big comb. Yeah. Out of the comb jar, the biggest comb. Yeah. Yeah, straight out of the comb juice or still dipped in comb juice? Always in the comb juice. Otherwise, yeah, what's the fucking point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I give it one <laughs> big comb too. Apologies. <laughs> it was the best comb I'd seen. Uh, like Jeffrey Comb piece I'd seen all month. Wow. Bold yeah. statement. No, well, I don't, I'm don't. i not afraid to, uh, to say it like it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was great. I think he was having a lot of fun with it too, which, was, which is always nice to see. You want everyone to be happy all the time. Absolutely. You want them to get their payday, but also for it to not be about the payday, you know? You want it to be about the fun of self-expression. The point of this podcast is that I just want Jeffrey Combs to be happy. <laughs> this is really nice. That's a really good undertone, <laughs> uh, under subtext to have for this show. I'm a bloody sweetheart. Hey, and, and Jeff, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> Jeff, if you're listening, why? <laughs> Who better? to listen i hope he listens to it with one of those like bluetooth speaker headbands and i hope he like listens to it when he's trying to get to sleep at night it would be so nice does the headband does that put put the sound in through the eyes no <laughs> <laughs> no it's 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 a headband okay. like a lycra headband yeah. that's got flat bluetooth speakers on each side oh, so right. that you can listen to music when you're lying on your side oh that's good yeah yeah, yeah. And you can connect it to your phone with Bluetooth speakers. Oh yeah, that's that's a good yeah, that's a good system. Okay, right, right. I would love to know how you thought sound could be transmitted via speakers through the eyeballs. Well, my friend had one a, a a headphone that basically just clips to the cartilage of your ear, right? One, one piece on each side, and it does vibrations through the ear. But also, if you press it against your bone. You basically hear it in the reverberation of your skull. I hate it. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> and so you could probably do that near the eye, and that would be close enough to the ears that you could hear it. I don't think I've ever considered the possibilities of using any other orifice in my head <laughs> for listening. <laughs> oh, Lisa, you're so naive. <laughs> I have so much to learn about the ways of the world. Mm. One day I'm going to see such magic colours when I finally use my nose to see. 
I'm picturing two eyeballs peeking out of your nostrils. That's also what I was thinking of. Yeah. Wait, did, were you were you picturing them just in the nose, or were you picturing them with stalks and coming out like na- like snail eyes? Oh, no, I was pe- I was picturing them inside, sort of peeking out like it's like it's a secret. Okay, I was picturing them on stalks. Yeah, that's cool. Like looking around and being a bit more prehensile. Yeah, that's really cool because I think I, there's definitely like wires behind there, like you know. The eye definitely is connected to something. It would be cool if you could control that more than we do already do. Are you trying to imply that I can't control my eyes? Sexist. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> That's all I came here to do. <laughs> all right, ATB, anything to plug? Lisa, there's always the Two in the Think Tank podcast that Andy and I do. There's always You can always be li- listen to episodes of The Pop Test, which is a science quiz podcast that we do, and any numbers that go to that help our chances of getting other seasons because that one was made by <laughs> an actual company and that's all you can always listen to shusher shusher guided meditations which is something i did but um i haven't done any new episodes in a while but i one day i am planning on getting there yes i can heartily recommend any or all of those podcasts all very good for all different purposes if you've enjoyed the dulcet tones of alistair's voice shusher is very good if you've enjoyed his comedy, Two in the Think Tank, is very good. If you enjoy being a big fucking nerd, then you'll enjoy the pop test. Yeah, look, I, it, we contain multitudes. You're a beautiful onion, my friend. Thank you. It's funny that you should bring that, because just before coming into here, I tried to compliment, I was just joking, but I tried to compliment my uh, my wife by saying, and it was a joke compliment, but I said, you're like a beautiful pumpkin. And she said, that was the worst, best, worst, worst vegetable that you could compare me to. And I said, uh, <laughs> uh, a courgette? She goes, no. And I said, a potato. <laughs> and I said, what, what's a good vegetable to call you? I said, a cucumber. I went, you are like a gorgeous cucumber. What's what's her rationale behind that? I don't know. But, but I, this is what I found. Refreshing, uh, delicious. My kids love you. <laughs> if your wife is a cucumber, then your children are like those mini cukes that you can get in the supermarket. Yeah. You know who I think is behind those? Jerry Harvey. What? I think Jerry Harvey is a major investor in those mini cukes. No. (laughs) No, that's ruined mini cukes for me. Great, mini cukes are cancelled, guys. (laughs) Do you want to plug any socials or anything like that? Um, And also I'm on Twitter at AlistairTB and I'm on Instagram at A Trombley Virtual, which is very easy to find. Uh, The Two in the Think Tank Twitter is at Two in Tank, right? Yeah, that's right. You got it. Look at me go. Mmm. And as usual, you can follow this podcast on a number of different social media platforms. Take your pick. You can go for uh, Twitter and Instagram at Reanimates Pod. Those are available. You can go for at Reanimates Podcast on Facebook and Tumblr. Also available, hotly contested. You can also find the episodes on YouTube at Reanimates Podcast, or you can just search it in the search bar. I assume. I assume that's how the internet works. Mm-hmm. If you like watching or listening to podcasts on youtube some people do i've heard tell people are wild that way you heard about this thing this internet you can't move for internet out there Mm -hmm. it is all over the shop Mm -hmm. yeah i'm absolutely stuck (laughs) (laughs) like quicksand yeah the pressure is immense (laughs) no no you're no you're you're not in a you're not in the internet al you're in a submarine (laughs) oh well i need to i need to breach (laughs) No, no, you're giving birth. Stop out. Oh, dilated. (laughs) 